Hey everyone, welcome back to the Bitcoin layer. I'm Nick Batia, and today we have Rachel Premack. She is a supply chain specialist, uh, our first one on the show, so we're really excited to have her today. She is the editorial director of Freight Waves and the author of the Freight Waves newsletter called Modes. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get into covering the supply chain? Yeah, so I joined Freight Waves earlier this year, but before I was at Freight Waves, and for those of you who don't know, Freight Waves is a uh, data and media startup that really looks into logistics and the supply chain. Um, before I joined Freight Waves earlier this year, I was at Business Insider. I covered the trucking industry there. I was also on our features and our investigations team. But I've really been covering trucking, especially since 2018, and definitely um, amid the pandemic, amid the last uh, two, I guess now three years, I've been looking more into ocean and rail and even barge shipping. So there's tons going on in the supply chain, and it's really cool because every day you really learn something new about um, how logistics works. So it probably a very popular topic during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic as supply chains are basically the center of almost every conversation that's global macro related because of the supply chain impact on inflation. So what was it like covering the supply chain during this um, period of intense focus? Yeah, so it's it's really interesting because in the the first few years that I was on this beat, like no one really wanted to talk with me or if they did, it was, it was along lines of, Oh, you cover trucking. Like, isn't that going to just be automated in the next year or two? Uh, which obviously did not pan out. It was, it was definitely interesting because there was, there was just suddenly a larger realization that what, how things get places, how things move around suddenly people realize like, oh, it doesn't just appear on my doorstep or appear on my, uh, you know, shelves at a local store. So definitely trying to A, show that this is a thing, this is a thing that they should be following. And then also that it's not as simple as it seems. So here's, here's one example. Um, you know, in the past few months, uh, the cost to move an ocean container has actually uh, lowered quite drastically. You know, uh, last summer it would probably be around twenty thousand dollars over the spot market to move an ocean container. Now it's around two thousand dollars, and I see people posting this chart on Twitter of like the container price going way up and then dropping, and being like, "Inflation is over!" Like no more like because we've gotten rid of this ocean shipping cost. It's it's done. Like we're free. And it's, it's not as simple as that because, A, that's just the spot market, which is half or much less than half of the overall uh, ocean shipping market. And B, there is so much stuff that we have here already that was moved under those inflated costs. So sure, of course, uh, spot rates have declined really drastically, but it's not going to be the instant fix to inflation that, that you might think. That's really interesting because I'm I will be the first to admit I'm guilty of it. Um, <clears throat> you know, watching the shipping costs skyrocket during the pandemic and then seeing them come off, I didn't even know that that was only the spot rate and that there's yeah. a forward curve that's hidden from us behind the scenes. Um, but that you know, it's an indicator to me that inflation might be might have already peaked and it's coming down. But you know, it's important to note that that is only just one piece of the puzzle. And um, there are a lot more things to watch. So what what are some of the things that you watch that are either publicly available or not publicly available, meaning that it's a data source that you guys pay for at Freight Waves and that we wouldn't see? One of the things that as macro people, we generally watch are like FedEx earnings announcements, for example, mm -hmm. where they'll make a whole bunch of assessments on the global economy and the state of it. Uh, we also have trucking rates that are publicly available, but what are some of the things that you watch closely? Yeah, so trucking spot rates is definitely a good one. Really spot rates on ocean and trucking. I know I was just 
saying denouncing ocean spot rates, but um, obviously the contract rates does follow what the spot rates may be. It's just not really that instantaneous effect that it seems like some people were were framing. Um, yeah, trucking spot rates, ocean spot rates are definitely really good to follow. Um, one thing that at Freight Waves that we really follow, and this is available, it's not it's available to our subscribers, and we regularly publish articles on this is the outbound tender uh index so something interesting in the trucking world is that you can uh it's pretty common to let's say you make a contract or make an agreement to move some sort of truckload but it's really common to then break that agreement so the reason you would break that agreement as a trucking company is because you could make way more money on the spot market. And we saw this a lot in 2021 where you had, you know, average, medium, kind of decent rates on the contract market that were set up uh, a year or even years ago. Um, but you could just make way more money on the spot market. So we saw the contract rejection rate go up to, I think, around like 15 to 20 percent. And we noticed in early earlier this year, early in 2022, that that rate was starting to steadily decline. And for us, that kind of indicated, OK, this isn't a coincidence. This means that uh, these trucking companies really want to honor their contracts and there isn't the same sort of options on the spot market anymore. They really have to abide by their contracts. So that rate has steadily declined this year. Um, and it's, I, I, I haven't looked at the most recent numbers, but it's around, I believe, two to 5% now of contracts being rejected. And I can go into a little bit more detail about that, but it is really interesting, the shift um, away from the contract market in trucking and into the spot market. And that's really that's really reversed this year, which indicates to us that uh, rates are, are just rapidly declining and the freight economy generally is is really deteriorating. So if if I have that right, when spot rates or when um, contract contracts are broken at a higher mm -hmm. rate, it's uh, a sign that truckers are going and chasing the high spot rates. And when yeah. the you know, when they stop breaking contracts as they are currently, it means they're honoring it, means they're not chasing these higher spot rates because of uh, breakage in the supply chain or, or some uh, nuances in demand there. Is that correct? Right, right, exactly. And there's less of an incentive for retailers or manufacturers to break those contracts because then it's like, great, now I have to find someone else to, to move this freight. So it does really indicate to us when the contract rejection rate is is especially high that um, it means that it's a really favorable market for trucking companies. And give our audience where they can find uh, your newsletter. I know we usually do that at the end, but just plug where okay. people can go subscribe to get this data, please. So we're at FreightWaves.com. We also have a platform called Sonar, which is subscription only. You can... Um, sign up to get that all of this sort of data at your fingertips. Um, and it goes into probably a little bit more granular detail than I think uh, your audience, who I imagine are not trucking companies or, or uh, retailers, or perhaps they are, but who knows. Um, you know, we get into like specific lanes and all this sort of, all this sort of nuance. But if you kind of just want like the high level just to, you know, as your sort of gateway into into the trucking world freightwaves.com and my newsletter is at freightwaves.com slash modes or you can just go on my twitter which is at rrpre and you can find all of that there great and we we will uh have all of that in the show notes for everyone so let's get into now inflation you wrote recently a piece about bizarro inflation now some items are are not really moving around in price and some are going at double digit rates. So what does bizarro inflation mean to you? Uh, what are some of the things in each category and how did this happen? 
Yeah, so I I refer to bizarro inflation as things that things that you don't really need are getting cheaper and cheaper. Smartphones, TVs, uh, kind of apparel generally. And yes, obviously we all need apparel, but I think we all know that people often buy clothes and footwear not when they need them, but just you know, kind of for fun or as a hobby or, or what have you. Um, those sorts of things are getting less and less expensive. But then when you look at the core commodities, things like rent, eggs, fuel oil, potatoes, bread, just all sorts of food, energy, and housing, the, uh, those are getting more and more expensive. And sometimes even the largest increases on record we, we're seeing right now, um, and they're they're kind they're connected and they're interconnected and not interconnected because one reason why TVs and air fryers and headphones and standing desks are getting cheaper is because retailers think okay. Uh, consumers don't have enough money to buy these sort of luxury goods. We've got to slash costs. Um, and the reason why things like food and fuel and housing, or really more specifically food and fuel, are getting more expensive is the war in Ukraine pushing up energy prices. Food is a really low uh, margin good, so any sort of changes in input pricings for food or agricultural goods or uh, consumer packaged goods, that's going to be really quickly reflected in the price. Whereas, let's say... Uh, you know, gas prices go up, uh, the cost to transport iPhones go up. iPhones are such a high margin good that that's probably not going to be, you know, immediately uh, reflected in that final price. So it's a it's kind of an interesting thing to to monitor is, is why is it that these non-necessities are getting cheaper and cheaper when uh, things that we actually need are getting more expensive and it's it's definitely been interesting to track this year how the consumer has been responding to that, um, and the response isn't quite what what I think um, many would have expected. So, what uh, when we get down to food and the the high cost of food right now relative to all the consumer goods that are more discretionary in nature and aren't really a staple that needs to be in the household. What are some of the things that we can look for to see if that will actually come back down? So the sources of the inflation on the food side of things, what do we watch to anticipate if that's going to continue or not? I think energy prices is really the key thing to look at uh, just because it is such a low margin good. If those prices go back down, which we, I, I believe, uh, especially for gas and diesel in the U.S., we are kind of starting to see that lower a little bit. Um, that's definitely one of the big things to watch. Um, then then there are like kind of unexpected shocks that are, are increasing some of these prices. Um, there's a bird disease going around that is definitely increasing the cost of eggs. Eggs is one of the big, uh, let me just double check here. Yeah, 59.6% more expensive um, in November of this year compared to the previous year. So these are really, I don't know if that was the largest increase on record, but that was definitely one of the larger increases that we've seen in the price of eggs. So that's kind of a whole different conversation, not as related to looking at uh, the price of grain, which is certainly the big the big thing. Um, the, the problem is, you know, Ukraine is such a crucial exporter of sunflower oil, corn, wheat, all of these sorts of oils and inputs that we don't really think about, um, but are really important to our uh, our uh, modern food economy. So it's, it's hard to say whether or not these prices will decrease um, unless the war in Ukraine really starts to cool off and, and end, essentially. One of the other uh, things I hear comes from Ukraine are certain auto parts and mm. the auto industry is uh, facing some acute shortages in certain parts of its supply chain due to uh, supply from Ukraine. So can you talk about the auto sector? One of the big things is um, chips, right? They can't get chips. Does the chip 
shortage. Um, I'm not a big fan of using the term chip shortage because I think that uh, the chip situation has a lot more to do with U.S. China politi- political geopolitical relations mm-hmm. than it does any maybe shortage per se. But what are your thoughts on the chip uh, arena? And how much does it have to do with the supply chain uh, explicitly in your view versus maybe China, perhaps? Yeah, so the chip issue is definitely really key to the whole supply chain conversation because most most goods actually are no longer experiencing supply chain shortages or supply chain issues except for autos. Like autos is really that one area of the supply chain where we are still seeing a ton of delays, a ton of backup. And as you mentioned, a big reason for that is our reliance on our reliance for these inputs in China, in in China especially. Um, So zooming out a little bit more, if you were to buy, I wrote about this a few months ago, if you were to buy a European car or a Japanese or Korean automobile right now, it's, there's probably going to be a significant backup, a significant delay for that vehicle because of where those inputs are coming from. U.S. US autos are obviously going to be less likely to be sourced from, uh, those inputs are somewhat less likely to be sourced from Europe or China or East Asia generally, not going to be affected by the war in Ukraine or the shutdowns and lockdowns in China. It's much easier to buy an American car right now. The kind of the, the interesting side effect of that is that most U.S. automakers have moved away from sedans and small cars. It's mostly pickup trucks and SUVs. So if you're trying to buy a small car right now, you really cannot. It's it's all about pickup trucks and SUVs because really only U.S. automakers are able to are, are really having their supply chains back fully online. That's a whole other <laughs> like conversation topic. But definitely the chip issue is the really the main and biggest area where we are still seeing any sort of supply chain crunchiness, essentially. Um, and as you mentioned, that that really does go back to the war in Ukraine and lockdowns in China rather than any other sort of COVID. Well, obviously, the, the lockdowns in China are, are COVID related, but um, any sort of typical COVID related uh, impact. And so we are probably going to see that persist, right? Because um, until you actually have a genuine rearrangement of the chip supply chain around the world that this chip shortage is is not really going to uh, get better. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is interesting because we are starting to see more domestic manufacturing of things like chips, even things like lithium, things that are really kind of I think until recently forgotten parts of the supply chain or forgotten parts of manufacturing because they're, they come so early in the process. Um, actually, in my mom's hometown in rural Michigan, they are opening up a, a semiconductor fa- factory, which is really interesting, really great to see that some more of this domestic manufacturing is coming back online for really um, complex sort of manufacturing processes like chips. Unfortunately, those factories take years and years to come online. It's not like opening a microbrewery or something. It's It takes years and years for that to come online. So as you mentioned, uh, these sorts of issues are not going to be solved in the next year or two. It's probably more of a five to 10 year process that we see um, that we see more of this ma- manufacturing of inputs like chips back in the U.S. and meaningfully back in the U.S., Okay, so so uh, on the trucking front, uh, you mentioned automated trucking. Give us a timeline. Is that something that, I mean, I saw Tesla just received a big order for their semis. I think it was one of their first big orders. Is automated trucking going to be a thing here in the next two years, five years? How do you see it unfolding? And what are maybe some of the larger impacts of that sort of move? Yeah, so automated trucking, it's definitely something that's been thrown about as an idea and as a like really disruptive 
potential possibility for for trucking, especially because labor costs are really the major input for large trucking fleets. Um, you know, if you can get rid of that labor equation, you're saving ta- hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Um, obviously, that would that would likely come down in reducing consumer costs. So it's a it's a really exciting potential for um, for trucking companies and probably for consumers generally if if automated trucking can happen. On the other hand, you're then dealing with two million unemployed uh, workers who some have college degrees, some don't. Um, majority men, uh, slightly majority white. It's it's a also in in Canada especially. It's like a key employer of immigrants and new uh, entrants into the country. So it's definitely not a as with all automation technology. It's not like a you know amazing like idea for everyone. But as, as for the actual impact of of trucking, of, of automated trucking and how likely it is. Right now we're seeing um, revenue, revenue producing, revenue loads actually moving, but it's, it's a really small case study. So I know of one company that's moving, that's moving free. I forget if it's in Texas or Arizona, but it's just between one city or another, all interstate, you know, back and forth, back and forth, like very predictable routes which is a lot of the trucking industry are those sort of like interstate, uh, I should say like within one state, predictable routes. But a lot of trucking is not those sort of predictable routes. You are going up, uh, you know, a mountain in January in, uh, you know, in West, in Eastern Oregon. And that's, that's not something that we don't really, we don't really have uh, automated technology that can, that can scale mountains with an 80,000 pound truck. Um, that's already a really hard job for actual human drivers to do. You have to be incredibly experienced to have jobs like that. So I could see, I could see automation uh, maybe taking over some of these smaller routes, smaller, more predictable, flat, non snow threatening routes in the next 10 years but i think the industry is getting more and more bearish for sure when it comes to automation it's not as simple as it seemed i mean even even on in the rail industry you still have two people driving a train like and that's a predictable the most predictable route you can imagine because it's just tracks. You're not dealing with other people on the road. I mean, you are dealing with other trains, but you're not dealing with, um, you know, a person who's about to cut you off. It's, it's, it, it, it seems challenging to, for me at least, to imagine trucking becoming completely automated or even like 50, 30 to 50% automated in the next like decade or two, I think maybe looking forward 10, 20 years, that could be more likely. But I think looking at the next 10 years, it seems unlikely that we'll see any sort of meaningful automation take over the industry. That's great perspective. So tell us about the rail strike, what's going on in US rail right now. And and uh, please, of course, lead it back to inflation. How is it impacting inflation right now or on a go forward basis? So, okay. So the rail strike, we averted it. It's not happening. There's no wildcat strike. Like we're good. It's fine. But from July until I guess earlier this month, earlier in December, um, it was kind of lo- looming was like the big word that that uh, people used. And it was especially notable in the chemicals industry, agriculture, um, you know, manufacturing, all of these sorts of early, earlier inputs into the, into our economy. Um, and there wasn't, to my knowledge, there wasn't like a, an explosion in rail rates exactly, but had it happened or rather even the strike of it, the, the possibility of it happening certainly did disrupt supply chains. Uh, We saw, I think we saw in September that chemical shipments just stopped for, 
I don't know if it was a full week, but it was it was about three to four days, I believe. And any sort of disruption in the supply chain generally, that all can get passed down to consumers. So I remember when I started covering the industry in 2018, uh, there was an increase in trucking rates after this one major federal regulation that essentially cut down how many uh, hours a driver can work in a day. Um, after that regulation passed, we saw um, just every random good you can imagine going up in price. Chips Ahoy. Um, I don't know why Chips Ahoy is the first one that comes to mind, but all of these, especially on the food side, all of these consumer packaged goods just like went up in price. Halliburton like inc- announced price increases. Just every every imaginable product increased in price and especially especially on those low margin goods um so without the rail strike actually happening i don't think we saw any meaningful or noticeable inflation but even the the threat of it was pretty um pretty pretty disruptive the other side of things that hasn't been discussed as much is the barge industry so this is moving agricultural goods mostly on the Mississippi River. That's the big barge corridor. And very unfavorably, uh, unfavorable timing, there is the lowest water levels on the Mississippi River in 30 years. We saw that um, earlier this fall, fall, you know, late fall, winter. And it it was really it was really disruptive for farmers because if you are trying to export wheat or move any sort of wheat or soybeans, um, barges is a really good way to do that, especially if you're exporting. So um, we saw barge rates increase. I forget the exact number, but they increased, I think like 300, 400 uh, percent in September and October, and that was pretty noticeable. That was pretty notable for, you know, again, going back to this idea that food is really low margin, um, you know, seeing seeing any sort of transportation increase like that for wheat, especially, that's going to get passed down to consumers eventually. The other side of this is that barge freight is often exported. So I guess kind of the, the, the bottom line here is that for for goods that are really low margin, any sort of increase in transportation costs will be passed down to con- to the consumer, like without a doubt. Um, so tracking that's really really important. And it's really great perspective for our audience because we are a global macro research provider, so we're looking at such uh, macro issues. It's sometimes hard to remember that the source of inflation can be so specific when it comes to each and every good. And as you mentioned, low levels of the Mississippi River can cause inflation. Uh, Railway labor situation can cause inflation. Um, And, you know, thinking long term, AI or a lack thereof over a long term in the trucking industry can cause inflation or disinflation. So Um, We really appreciate your perspective when it comes to breaking down the supply chain. What is happening in New England right now? Is there anything Mm -hmm. that we should note in terms of, um, you know, with the winter and gas prices or uh, energy prices there? Yeah, so the so I I haven't checked in on the latest uh, levels of uh, energy inventory in New England in the last week or so, but it's it's generally an area that does really struggle with um, with fuel inventories more so than any other part of the country, you know, except for, you know, Puerto Rico or Hawaii or, or what have you. But within the contiguous United States, it is definitely the area that struggles the most with keeping uh, fuel inventories high. And that's because the, um, you know, that key pipeline that moves fuel from Texas to Linden, New Jersey, or New York City, to, to keep things simple, um, it stops in New Jersey. It does not go up to New England. And as those who follow sort of the the Jones Act conversation know, it is, you know, more 
expensive to move fuel from within the U.S. to New England. It's more cost effective and more profitable for, you know, uh, an American fuel company, an American energy company in Texas to move that fuel to South America or Europe, especially right now, um, rather than just moving it domestically. So keep definitely keeping track of what's going on in New England is really important. The fuel oil situation is also definitely a worrisome side effect of this. For me, as I mentioned, growing up in Michigan, now living in New York City, I don't really think about fuel oil, but I, I think the last time I saw a third of New England residents actually use fuel oil for heating their homes. We are, at, at the time of this recording, it's mid to late December, and with fuel oil really increasing in cost up to, let's see, 58% more expensive from last year on average, um, it's definitely a really, it's it's a, I imagine, especially for low income New England residents, that's, that's a really big, that's a really big stress. We haven't seen any signs of there being a shortage or, you know, that anyone will necessarily go without fuel oil or that, you know, any sort of like elements of that. But that was certainly a concern a few months ago that I was tracking a bit was this potential fuel oil shortage in New England, specifically this winter. But thankfully, we have avoided that. But definitely in general, looking at New England fuel inventories is is a really, is definitely a, a good way to track what is going on more generally. Because if that's, if, if, if the Northeast is running out of fuel, obviously, that's very concerning for the entire country, because that's our big population center. But um, they are also bizarrely the most exposed to any sort of potential of a fuel shortage because of just the way that our pipelines are laid out. Is there any relationship that you cover between the energy supply uh, situation or the supply chain itself in the United States and the strategic petroleum reserve, which has been in the news a lot lately? Yeah, yeah. I haven't covered that as closely, so I probably wouldn't be able to answer any questions around that uh, particularly well, unfortunately. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I just wanted to ask because the SPR uh, does obviously impact the energy market, but it's not necessarily related to the energy supply chain as we uh, see it or as we want to you know, move gas and oil around in the country. So uh, one more question that um, is more from our side of things, but I wanted to get your perspective. What do you think about the explanation that the inflation that we've seen over the past couple of years is due to monetary and fiscal stimulus versus supply chain? So you might not have uh, the strongest opinion on whether or not some or all of it came from monetary stimulus or fiscal stimulus, but you are seeing the direct impact of supply chain issues on inflation. So how do you see the argument from the other side, from people that say that, oh, it's all because of money printing or because the government did, uh, you know, um, you, you know, universal basic income payments essentially throughout the pandemic? So in my opinion, I it's hard for me to picture it the sort of supply chain crunches that we had in late 2020 and through 2021 without the fiscal stimulus, because, you know, this is pretty universally agreed on with most of the like freight and supply chain economists and experts that, that I, I speak to without people having a bunch of extra cash to buy stuff with essentially um, in 2020 and 2021, we wouldn't have seen that same, um, you know, shopping spree that we saw in, in the last, in, in, you know, the early 2020s, you could say. Um, and without that, you know, incredible increased demand for goods, we wouldn't have seen, let's say a hundred ships waiting outside of the ports of LA and Long Beach, hoping to offload containers Obviously, so much of the supply chain shortages and crunches had to do with the fact that um, 
you know, things out, things outside of the U.S. control, things happening, especially in East Asia and China. Um, but it, it's hard to imagine that we would have the same sort of, you know, for example, going back to the port of L.A., Long Beach, they were unable to find workers. And at the same time, they had an unusual onslaught of demand and containers and ships to unload. Um perhaps because of this sort of fiscal, or more than perhaps, because in large part because of this fiscal stimulus, they were unable to hire employees to offload these containers and to drive the uh, drive these containers around. Um, so you got that side. And because of the fiscal stimulus, you had people buying more stuff from overseas and importing more stuff from overseas. So it's really hard to imagine the supply chain the it's hard to imagine the severity of these supply chain crunches without the fiscal stimulus that that occurred throughout 2020 and 2021 um and i I don't i in my in in the supply chain world that's not a controversial statement like it's pretty straight up that if there weren't for this fiscal stimulus that people would not have been buying this much and on the same token people probably would have been working more. There w- would have been a higher labor force participation. So that's just, that. In, in my perspective and in the, you know, industry's perspective, if I can speak on behalf of the, of the entire industry, um, which I'm not qualified to do, but I guess I'll do it right now. Um, that's definitely, that's de- it's, it's definitely all interrelated. It's great. It's again, it's great perspective because, we can attribute uh, price increases, acute price increases to acute issues in the supply chain. But it's important to bring it back to the idea that the money that was sloshing around came from a fiscal stimulus and that the fiscal stimulus itself triggered so many of the breakages. And of course, to take it back even one more step, with the monetary stimulus as well, it enables the fiscal stimulus and it all kind of goes hand in hand. So to say that the cause of inflation is because of the Fed or it's because of the stimulus or it's because of the supply chain, it's really losing the plot because it does sound like it's everything. And the further away we get from what happened and the more we see CPI come down or spot rates on shipping come down and then it filter into CPI, maybe not eggs yet that are up 60% year over year in price, but many other things uh, we can get to, we can get a bigger picture and sense that, okay, it is all interrelated and it, whether or not you want to call it cyclical, it was definitely a blip in time that is fading because the pandemic is fading and then um, lockdowns are all in China, for example, are also going away. So do you have any opinions on um, what lifting lockdowns in China will do to prices here in the United States, how long that will take to filter and maybe what sectors of the economy will be impacted most? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting because, so I think, w- in the summer, in like you know, summer of 2022, we saw a decrease in imports in freight, especially going into our ocean ports. LA Long Beach was the big one that saw a pretty big drop off of freight, especially I think by August was really when that um, demand and volume fell off. And people were thinking, okay, well, once China comes out of lockdown, that demand and that volume will come back up and that will be great for our supply chain sh- supply chain shortages but by that point people the 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 demand for non for durable goods had already dropped off it had dropped off by the second quarter of this year um compared to the previous year so in my opinion it's hard for me to picture the lifting of lockdowns in China as something that is going to be a boon for inflation, because 
as we've been discussing, the big sources of inflation, um, inflationary pressures are in energy. I would say energy is number one, and then food kind of as a, as a secondary. But so much of that food inflation is because of energy inflation. So it's hard for me to really picture that the end of lockdowns in China would be that helpful because especially especially when we think about China being a key source for durable goods in the US, um, it's, that's not really the issue anymore. Um, I think I could certainly see the end of lockdowns in China being good for automotive supply chains and the chip uh, situation, of course. Um, but but looking at fuel and energy, at energy and food, um, it's hard for me to really say like once China lockdowns are over, like we'll be good, like it it will be it will be returned to normal. This has been fantastic insight, Rachel. We really appreciate you getting into all of these nuances in the supply chain, from energy to food to China to trucking to the Mississippi River. Uh, water levels and how it affects us all. Uh, Rachel, please give our audience one more time where they can find you on Twitter, where they can read your work at Freight Waves. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today at the Bitcoin Layer. Yeah, yeah, it was really fun. I, I appreciate all your questions. And it was it was fun being able to connect these small, small details to the, the bigger picture, especially in supply chain. Sometimes we get like too in the weeds and we forget to connect it to the larger idea. So always great to to get that opportunity. So I'm on Twitter at RRPRE, or you can just search my name, Rachel Premack. And you can also find all of the all of our work at FreightWaves at FreightWaves.com. And my newsletter is FreightWaves.com slash modes. And I would also recommend you guys follow um, the Freight Wave CEO Craig Fuller at Freight Alley, um, Alley spelled A L L E Y. Um, he posts lots of charts, lots of insights. Um, so I definitely recommend uh, giving him a follow as well. And yeah, thank thank you guys for for listening in. Well, we're all about the charts here, so we'll make sure to put that one in the show notes as well. Rachel Premack, thank you so much for joining us today at the Bitcoin Layer. The Bitcoin Layer is sponsored by Voltage, enterprise-grade provider of Bitcoin infrastructure. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.